This is the story of an oak tree, and perhaps more importantly, this tree's roots. This oak is the oldest tree on the prairie, and even though it was the first oak tree ever planted west of the Mississippi River, it thrives today, robust and energetic, because its roots are strong, deep, and nurturing. Since 1875, this mighty oak has been known as Southwestern University. Standing proudly among the verdant plains of central Texas, flourishing still from its predecessors, including McKenzie College, Wesleyan College, and Seoul University. We'll get to them in just a minute. But it first took root 35 years before that, in 1840, about a hundred miles to the southeast, in a little hamlet called Reutersville. American settlers were moving on to the Texas frontier, most from Europe, bringing with them their deeply held respect, hopes, and plans for education. From the first days of Stephen F. Austin's earliest settlement on the Brazos River, many schools, institutes, and colleges were planned, and a few were even begun. For 35 years, first as a republic and then as an American state, all higher education in Texas was planned established, and operated by various religious groups. Reutersville College was the very first of these to gain official recognition from the Republic of Texas. The Fayette County settlement where the college was located was named for the Reverend Martin H. Reuter, one of the first Methodist clergymen sent to the new republic. A former president of Pennsylvania's Allegheny College, Reuter had already drawn up a charter for a university before moving to Texas in the 1830s. Support for the school, probably to be located in Bastrop, had been pledged, but unfortunately Reuter passed away before he was able to begin the project. The Reverend Chauncey Richardson, another early Texas Methodist, obtained a charter for Reutersville College, signed by Mirabeau B. Lamar, President of the Republic of Texas, on February 5, 1840, a date still celebrated each year by the southwestern community, known as Charter Day. Reutersville College, the first in Texas, was the beginning of the fulfillment of Martin Reuter's vision for higher education on the Texas frontier. The effort, never without its difficulties, enrolled 61 students in the first year. The following year, that number grew to 100. In 1844, Reutersville College graduated its first senior class consisting of six young scholars, the first to be so honored by an institution of higher learning in Texas. In the next 12 years, Reutersville College would graduate 32 students, more than all the other colleges in Texas combined. Although the Reutersville community sought to keep the institution going in one form or another, the year 1856 turned out to be its last. During the 16 years of Texas' first institution of higher learning, a second Methodist effort to establish a university had come and gone in San Augustine. From early pre-Republic days through the first decades of statehood, San Augustine County was the scene of numerous, often violent, feuds. Denominational conflict between Presbyterians and Methodists was often a factor in this violence. When the Wesleyans heard that the local Calvinists were planning to open San Augustine University, they quickly announced the founding of Wesleyan College. Each founding group announced elaborate intentions for their schools, but neither achieved any lasting success. Wesleyan College received a charter from the Republic of Texas, signed by President Sam Houston in January of 1844. The school was officially opened on March 1st of that year. The Rev. Francis Wilson traveled hundreds of miles across the settled regions of Texas, raising funds for the construction as well as the operation of Wesleyan. Efforts to raise funds for the school and to build or secure adequate facilities were never very successful. Like its Calvinist rival, Wesleyan was short-lived, under four years. Even so, each of the schools boasted a few graduates. The competition between the Presbyterians and Methodists, never friendly, soon escalated into open armed conflict. For a time, each group had published rival newspapers in the small community, 
In August 1847, the editors of these rival papers, Presbyterian James Russell and Methodist Henry Kendall, attempted a duel in the streets of St. Augustine. Neither man was even able to wound the other, but the following day, Methodist Kendall shot and killed Presbyterian Russell. The scandal of these events effectively brought to an end the effort to establish Wesleyan University in St. Augustine. Even before the violence and scandal-plagued events in San Augustine, the Reverend John Witherspoon Pettigrew McKenzie, a Methodist circuit rider and pioneer missionary to the Choctaws, had begun a school on his plantation called Itinerance Retreat near Clarksville in Red River County. McKenzie began his school in the fall of 1841 with about 15 students. In the beginning, the project was housed in a small log structure attached to the side of McKenzie's home, essentially a log cabin. He instructed his earliest students at the preparatory level, and from these small beginnings, in just a few years, a full college campus offering a complete academic program had developed. McKenzie School grew steadily, and by 1845, the first year of Texas statehood, enrollment stood at 63 in three departments, elementary, female, and college. Two years later, McKenzie received a charter from the Texas State Legislature. That year, the college enrolled 86 students, all male, while the preparatory and female departments had smaller enrollments. This first charter was probably in the name of McKenzie Institute. A second charter was granted to McKenzie in 1853. By then, the McKenzie campus had grown to four large buildings, and the school offered a course list that included Latin, Greek, both Homer and New Testament, chemistry, moral and natural philosophy, and math, including geometry and calculus. Electives were offered in music and modern languages. In his 1925 study, The Development of Education in Texas, Frederick Eby considered McKinsey College to be the most successful institution of higher education in the entire Southwest. The school had campus newspapers and journals, debating societies, musical groups, and other such extracurricular activities, all modeled on those finer schools back east. By 1854, McKenzie had an enrollment of nearly 300 students taught by a faculty of nine, the largest school in the state. Students came not only from Texas, but Arkansas, Louisiana, the territories, later called Oklahoma, and even Missouri, these years were the high water mark for McKenzie College. Tuition, room and board, and laundry were $180 for 10 months, and private piano lessons were $60 per term. Sometimes the tuition was paid in produce or with the horse and saddle the student had ridden to school. Students had compulsory prayers at 4 a.m. and required chapel attendance. The Reverend McKenzie was so popular with the students that they were said to return home reluctantly at the end of each 10-month session. The state of Texas granted the final charter to McKenzie Male and Female College in January of 1860, while the school was still enjoying real success. That charter was signed by Governor Sam Houston and officers of both chambers of the state legislature. The beginning of the Civil War was the beginning of the end for McKenzie College, setting in motion the slow demise of this fine institution widely renowned for its robust academic excellence. This catastrophic national disaster emptied the school of male students who had left to join the ranks of the Confederate Army, reduced to the number of females enrolled, and severely depleted the faculty. But the school's founder and constant champion achieved what many thought impossible. The Reverend McKenzie, had kept the doors open throughout the war, and even for a few years following, with some small success. But by 1869, McKenzie College was closed. During McKenzie's most successful years, another group of Methodists began a new effort to establish a university over 200 miles to the south. In the early 1850s, Chapel Hill was a growing community of mostly Methodist residents in Washington County. Leaders of the community were committed to establishing a university of the first rank in their section of Texas along the lower Brazos River. 
Their first step was to obtain a charter for Chapel Hill Male and Female Institute, which was granted in February 1852. In its first years, though the governing board and leaders were Methodist, the institute had no denominational affiliation. However, the now-grown children of Martin H. Ruder took leadership of the institute in 1854 and began to formalize its Methodist connections. Two of the institute's early presidents were Philander S. Ruder and Alexander Ruder, and their sister Charlotta was a member of the faculty. They, along with the trustees, worked inexhaustibly to gain the support of the Methodist Texas Annual Conference. They succeeded in doing just that in 1855, finally convincing the Methodist Church to shift its official support from the fading fortunes of Reutersville College to a more formal relationship with Chapel Hill. Working with some of the local leadership, the conference reorganized the operation and named the newly formed school Seoul University in honor of Bishop Joshua Seoul, a leader of the southern branch of Methodism. The Texas State Legislature granted Seoul University a charter in February 1856. Almost from the beginning, Seoul University found itself facing multiple problems, especially financial difficulties. The main building was always in need of repair, other facilities and equipment were never completely adequate, and payment of the small faculty salaries was sometimes late. Then, in 1861, just as some stability seemed to be developing for Seoul University, the Civil War broke out. While the university was able to survive the loss of many of its students and faculty, what little financial support they had enjoyed quickly dried up, the post-war years bringing no significant improvement. After the war, severe economic distress throughout the South made recovery nearly impossible for Seoul University. Not only had war devastated Seoul's financial resources, but its fellow horsemen, disease, also took dreadful aim at the people of Chapel Hill. A yellow fever epidemic, followed by fears of additional outbreaks, greatly reduced the numbers of both the town and the school. On more than one occasion, the university was forced to suspend operations entirely. Several faltering efforts were made to stabilize the situation, garnering little success. The trustees even had difficulty finding a captain willing to command the ship, offering the presidential mantle to as many as five candidates, each refusing the honor in his turn. Finally, having already declined the offer, twice, the highly regarded Methodist clergyman Francis Asbury Mood accepted the challenge. He assumed his duties as president of Seoul University in the autumn of 1868. Conditions in Chapel Hill were less than adequate. The university building where Mood and his wife Sue were expected to live was in need of major repair, especially to its porous roof. The faculty and student body were both smaller than Mood had been led to expect, and the presence of neither was as dependable as he had hoped. For an entire year, President Mood did his best to put Seoul back on solid footing, but ultimately came to see the effort as futile. He suggested that the trustees might better serve the cause of higher education by creating a new post-war institution, a Methodist university whose mission is service to the entire southwestern United States. In 1869, the board enthusiastically adopted his proposal, presuming, perhaps, that the envisioned flagship institution would be located in Chapel Hill. History, however, was headed west, 111 miles west, to be exact. Mood immediately began to travel across the state, hoping to kindle fires of excitement for his plan to form one central university. But things had changed. Since Texas now had five Methodist conferences representing competing regions of the state, most observers considered his chances of success to be meager at best. The president, dauntless to the last, pressed on, attending all the Methodist conference sessions, each in its turn, making arduous journeys to Henderson, Paris, Weatherford, Goliad, and LaGrange. And he succeeded. Impressed with the man and his vision, every single Texas Methodist conference voted to endorse and proceed. They created the Joint Education Convention, calling for delegates from each of the five conferences. 
This group convened its first meeting in 1870 at Galveston. The Reverend John Witherspoon Pettigrew McKenzie was by this time considered by consensus to be the Dean of Texas Educators, a highly regarded leader in North and East Texas, and his support was surely essential to Mood's success. While McKenzie was only an alternate delegate to the first session, for a later meeting at Waxahachie, he was not only a fully credentialed delegate, he was even elected to preside. The Education Convention named the planned school Texas University and formed the Texas University Company at a meeting in Corsicana in 1871. The company then turned to our old friend, the Reverend Francis Asbury Mood, naming him the first president, or regent as the office was called in those days, of Texas University on the winter solstice of 1872. Now that they had a plan, a name, and a president, the next question to be answered was, where shall we put it? During the year and a half prior to his selection as the first regent of Texas University, Mood actively promoted the new school, traveling widely throughout the five Methodist conferences. By the time he was named to office, he had already received proposals of location from quite a few Texas communities. One of these was a small, isolated town not yet 30 years old, about 30 miles north of Austin, with an exploding population of 320, many of them devout Methodists. It was the seat of Williamson County and would grow by a factor of 10 in just eight years to well over 3,000. Their proposal included the deed to a large two-story structure already built designed to be a school. Not only was construction of the facility already complete, but the community augmented their offer with various gifts and additional property. The strength of this proposal greatly impressed Mood, who convinced the Texas University Company that these people were committed to education, making it fertile ground in which to plant the seeds of scholarship and service. The year was 1872. The place was Georgetown. In October of 1873, Texas University opened its doors in Georgetown to 32 young men considered by Regent Mood to be sufficiently prepared for university study. They were instructed in that first term by a faculty of three men, including the Regent himself. The two-story building was certainly adequate for the enrollment, but the equipment, especially for science classes, was not, and the library was far short of satisfactory. Mood considered these as merely the next challenges and to be sure, he could most certainly be congratulated for having lain the strongest of foundations for this long-sought institution of higher education. Texas University was guided by two separate boards. The Board of Trustees, comprising mostly businessmen and other laymen, was charged with handling financial and property matters, while the Board of Curators, initially comprising Methodist ministers, was responsible for all other aspects of university life. This division of governance continued throughout Mood's term as regent. In 1872, the company had submitted a proposed charter to the state legislature under the name of Texas University, and for the next two and a half years, the school operated as such. There was resistance to the application, however, from both the governor, E.J. Davis, and the state legislature. Several of these leaders hoped to reserve the name Texas University for an anticipated state-supported institution to be located in Austin. A solution was finally reached, and on February 6, 1875, exactly 35 years and a day since the charter of Reutersville College, the school in Georgetown received the next and final charter establishing Southwestern University, written in the style of the day as three words, and dating it from 1872, the beginning of the originally planned but never chartered Texas University. And there, in Section 7 of that new and final charter, was the unbroken line of the state's oldest academic family tree. The Texas legislature officially recognized Southwestern University as the successor to those four earlier schools, Reutersville College in 1840, Wesleyan College of St. Augustine in 1844, McKinsey College of Clarksville in 1848, and Seoul University of Chapel Hill in 1856. In the two years between opening and gaining the charter, Southwestern University had survived its birth pangs 
and was beginning a period of stability and growth. Enrollment increased, the faculty grew in number, and the school was accepted across Texas, except possibly in Chapel Hill, as the Central University for Methodism. Within ten years, the faculty had grown to nine from the first three, Francis Asbury Mood, now Southwestern's first president, being the only holdover from that original trio. A separate facility housing the new female department was constructed a few blocks west. Meanwhile, back on campus, a third story was added to the main building. A home on the southeastern corner of 12th and Myrtle was purchased for President Mood and his family, freeing up a few rooms on the first floor of the main building for the growing student body. In ten years, Mood had developed a unified educational effort, no simple task, given the often competing Methodist factions he sought to include, and had weathered numerous efforts to derail his mission and remove him from leadership. He had successfully transplanted the strong Methodist ethos of scholarship and service to the Central Texas Prairie, nurturing and sheltering it through the many challenges of new life. Sadly, though, his unceasing efforts irreparably damaged his health. In the late 1870s and early 80s, he was often homebound, sometimes even bedridden. In November 1884, at the age of 54, the Reverend Francis Asbury Mood, the last president of Seoul University, the first and only regent of Texas University, and the first president of Southwestern University, passed away in Waco, Texas, while attending yet another Methodist conference, still advancing the cause of his beloved school. And so, there you have it. The oldest university in Texas continues to thrive as the strongest oak on the prairie, and the faith, commitment, and sacrifice of those men and women of the four root colleges which gave rise to that great oak established that tradition of scholarship and service, the hallmark of Southwestern University for 175 years. <laughs>